All right. Well, hello there, good people. Oh, uh, see anybody in here just yet? So I'll just amuse myself. Just shout out whenever you come in. So I know you're here. We've started, so uh, hello everybody. Uh, I just don't see anybody coming in just yet. That's interesting. Oh, there's somebody. Hi, how you doing out there? I'm gonna wait a moment for some more people to get in here. So tonight we're gonna start talking about uh, some some permaculture design building it up from the ground up, starting with the most important thing, which is uh, your perennial sources of protein and calories. You know, you see a lot of uh, food forests out there, people doing permaculture, and what do they have growing? They've got fruit trees, and they've got some annuals scattered around there, and you look at that and go, well, how are you going to live off of some fruit trees and a couple of vegetables? It's, 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 Nice, but it's not something that you can actually survive off of. So tonight we're going to tackle that and show you some things that you can actually grow in your gardens and you can actually live on. Um, I'm going to need some help with keeping up with live chat. So I'm going to put the link up here real quick. If somebody can help me out with live chat, that would be greatly appreciated. We don't have a whole lot of people in right now, but... Uh, yeah, I imagine they'll probably show up eventually. Hello there. See people starting to come in again. Hi. Oh, yeah, you didn't miss it. You both are here. You may be the only two here. <laughs> Mary is trying to find a place to park, so she'll be along here in a little bit also. Hi, Gail. Hi, Free Handley. Oh, uh, let me see here. I guess I could go ahead and get started. Get my little show notes here and talk about some things. You may have heard some terms before. Hey, Bushcraft family. Um, just click on the link and come into the studio and keep me advised of live chat as it as it comes up because I probably won't be able to keep up with everything. If people have questions, just pass them on to me. That, that's all, really. Okay, so you may have heard some terms like back to Eden. Maybe you've heard of a uh, Ruth Stout method of gardening. The term permaculture might have hit your ears at some point in the past. You may have heard of agroforestry. I do talk about agroforestry a lot. You may have heard the term food forest or maybe something like key line design, swales, things like that. And you're like, okay, well, I think I might know something about these. I want you to just put a peg in what you think you know for the moment and, and not worry about that too much. <laughs> <laughs> because a problem that we have is people get an idea in their head that they've heard this stuff before, they know what it's about, and then they don't really pay much attention to it because it's not applicable to their situation. Um, hopefully what I'm going to be talking about tonight is applicable to everybody's situation unless you're living in an apartment. Um, you may have heard of a few names also, so I'm going to drop these out here. P.A. Yeomans, if you have, may, may have heard of this guy. Bill Mollison, you may have heard of this guy. You may have heard of David Holgram, and you might have heard of a fellow by the name of Mark Shepard. And uh, these are some of the people that we know in permaculture and agroforestry that have done a lot of good work over the past. But there's one name I'm going to add to the list that you may not have heard of before, and his name is Carol Conrad. Now, Carol Conrad was my grandfather. He came down from Kansas during the Dust Bowl years uh, to here in northeastern Oklahoma to start farming the the Illinois River, or not the Illinois River Valley, the Arkansas River Valley. This is in um, 1934. At the time, Bill Mollison was a toddler. And the big problem in those days was trying to figure out how to stop the desertification 
of the Great Plains region in Kansas and in Oklahoma. The Dust Bowl was just beginning to get started. People were losing uh, just tons of topsoil and fertility from their farms. And it looked like the entire region was going to turn into a desert. So people were scrambling to try to find a way to stop the desertification of this formerly very rich ecosystem, which was gra grasslands previously. Grasslands that had been maintained originally back during the, the end of the ice age by the mammoths. And then as the mammoths died out, they were replaced by the American bison. And then whenever the bison died out, there was nothing to maintain these grasslands. As long as the weather patterns held up, they were okay. But whenever the weather patterns failed, drought hit and we had dust bowl. And it was made worse by the fact that the farmers had come out and started stripping off the covering of grass and planting in grain, 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 because it was a good way to make money really quick. But um, unfortunately in the long run, Yes, Conrad Homestead. Uh, Carol Conrad is is is, is my grandfather. Uh, he and his brother Chester were uh, two brothers that came in from Kansas and settled here and started up farming. I grew up on uh, Carol's old farm, and I got to see firsthand what it was that he did to help preserve the landscape. And it was a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, he was communicating with farmers all over the world that were dealing with the same sort of problem or trying to find solutions to the same problem. And one of those was P.A. Yeomans in Australia. So in 1954, when Yeomans publishes his book on permaculture principles, I know where at least some of that information came from. And I've got Gail backstage. I'm going to bring her up here. She'll help me with keeping up with live stream comments, questions, and things like that. Hello, Gail. Hello. All right, so just keep a track here, you know, keep track of live chat. And if somebody has a question that I need to address, let me know because I'm probably not going to notice it as, as okay. we get. All right, so I guys launch in on permaculture by talking about uh, the layers of a, a permaculture forest. Call it a food forest, you could call it uh, a woodland garden, is my preferred term. But you know, people put labels on things and then you think you know, know what we're talking about. Um, in just about every permaculture layout, you start up with, out with a canopy layer. This is the, the trees that are at the very top of the ecosystem, whatever those happen to be. In my case, they're gonna be pecan trees. They're the biggest, the tallest, they dominate the most of the landscape. Beneath that, we're gonna have another layer that is our understory trees. Uh, a lot of people think of these as being fruit trees uh, or possibly your, your uh, tall shrubs. Uh, in, in my particular case, we're talking about pear trees, uh, possibly some cherries, plums, peaches, that sort of thing. And also the hazelnut trees fall into this category. Um, some people will break this up into two separate layers where we have understory trees, which are full size trees, you know, 30, 40 foot tall. And then the big stuff is up over that. And then shrubs underneath that. I don't really have the space to fit that in where we're at. So I just have two layers, canopy, then understory. Then beneath that, we're gonna have our, our uh, herbaceous perennial layer. This is your woody perennial, vegetables, artichokes, um, a lot of your uh, bushes like uh, gooseberries and blackberries and raspberries and things like this. Conrad Homestead had a question. What what name of tree did you say for the canopy? Uh, it, it, in, in my location, which is zone 7A, we're using pecan trees for the, for the, for the canopy, for the upper story. All right, so after the herbaceous layer, we're going to have our ground cover layer. And ground cover layer can be any number of different things. Uh, for example, strawberries, for example, uh, that's one of them. You could also have uh, maybe a fairly low growing plant, like uh, maybe a perennial buckwheat as being ground cover underneath, underneath there. Then we have our vining layer. Vining layer is a plant that is able to grow up those canopy trees up the trunks and go up into the trees and also occupy space there. And then last, I've got the mycelial layer, which is the stuff that goes on underground. And I do classify this differently than a lot of people do. A lot of people will have a root vegetable layer that's taking space in the ground. And they do take space, root space in the ground. The problem with classifying that, them that way is your rooting vegetables don't have their energy uh, absorption occurring in the ground. They have their energy absorption occurring above ground. So they're taking up either uh, a vining space, like a sweet potato vine would, or you could have a sweet potato vine growing out as a ground cover. It could occupy that layer, but it does not occupy the ground itself. It occupies a space in 
the, the layers between the ground and the and the canopy. So I don't classify root vegetable crops as being a specific layer because they're not. The the energy that they derive comes from a different point. All right. So whenever you're designing your forest, one of the first things that you want to think about is how am I going to live off of this forest system that I'm designing? You don't want to be stuck in a situation where you have a whole bunch of fruit trees, which produce delicious, yummy fruit, but you can't really live on. I, I know I've heard people say that you can live on fruit. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I don't think I'd want to try it. You'd probably be very regular. <clears throat> probably. So when we're, when we're first starting out, we want to look at what can we grow that produces calories for us, that produces protein for us? What can we grow that we are actually going to be able to live on? as opposed to just, well, this is a nice supplement to our diet, but we can't live on it. So that's where we're starting tonight. We are going to be using Plants for Our Future, the website. It's an excellent resource. I'll be bringing up a screen share in a, here in a moment. Um, but really quick, before we get started, I wanted to show you a diagram and I'm gonna do a screen share here, if I can. This is the first time doing a screen share, so. Let's see. All right, so let me know. If you can see this. All right, what I've got here, I'm going to run it around. I have a diagram here showing the footprint of a pecan tree. And in this diagram, the scale is 60 feet across. So from this, this corner over here to this corner over here, that's a total of 60 feet. Here in the middle, this would be 10 feet. The trunk of the tree, if it was fully mature, would be about six or seven feet across with enough room for crap, strawberries or something like that planted around the base. All right, now these little tiny circles that I have over here, all nine of them are 15 foot across, which is more than enough room for a fruit tree or a hazelnut or any number of other little things that you can plug in all around the outside here. Now, in an actual forest design, you probably would not have them spaced under the tree this way. You'd have them more out here at the corners. Inside. If this was the east side here, you would have room for blueberries here, 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 perhaps here as well. Gooseberries, currants, gooseberries, gooseberries. Uh, the space that these trees, this is the the coverage of the canopy portion of the tree, the base of the tree is only about right around there. So there's plenty of space in between for you to put other perennials, for example, the perennial buckwheat that I mentioned earlier as an understory or ground cover here. Uh, during the time that this tree and these other tr associated larger trees and bushes are growing, all of this space is very open, which means you can grow squash or pumpkins or corn or beans, tomatoes, sweet potatoes, obviously, all this stuff you can grow while you're waiting for this big tree to come up and dominate the landscape and the perennials to take over. Now, all of this added together is enough food to feed two people, all under one tree, 60 feet across from this side to the other. And we're, we're talking about feeding them with everything they need, not just, not just give them some vegetables every now and then as a supplement to their diet, but really, everything they need all under one tree. If you're wondering what two people under one tree look like, I've got a kind of a, a cheesy drawing here. Okay, let me go back to StreamYard. And let me find our plants for a future. Let me stop the share real quick. Okay, so there was a just a, a just a brief diagram showing what that might look like. A tree, all the assorted trees underneath it, and of course, kind of a, a little tongue-in-cheek picture. There's there's the man and the woman living under that one tree by themselves. But that's just 60 feet across. That much productivity in 60 feet. How many of us have 60 feet of available space in our yards? Do, do we have 60 feet of space that we could that we could put something like that in? Okay, so this, this is not something that's totally impossible. It's not something that can't be done. But one thing you do need to remember is if you're gonna be planting pecan trees, they do take at least 15 to 20 years before they start really producing well. 
So the sooner you get started on planting those trees that take a long time to grow, the better off you are in the long run. But of course, you can always start planting those long-term trees whenever your children are born. If you gave a, as a birthday present to your child on their first birthday, one large nut-bearing tree, and then repeated that for the next six years. So they have seven of them. And then the next few years, you follow it up with fruit trees and maybe some of those hazelnut trees. They take nine years to reach their maximum maturity. By the time your child is 18 years old, they will have enough food to feed not only themselves, but their new spouse and their children. And what a wonderful present that you could give to your own children than to have their own food security for their lifetime established for them by the time they're ready to leave home. I had one in my backyard. I didn't even know it was a pecan tree for a while, but it started producing. So <laughs> I just kept watering it so it'd get taller. And then it started putting something on. I was like, are those pecans? Okay, maybe a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you could just call me the dinghy gardener. Didn't even know it was a pecan tree, but I water it now because I know it's a pecan tree. Okay, now we're going to share what do we have here? Chrome tab? I think it's Chrome tab. PFAF. Here we go. All right. So up on the screen now, we've got Plants for a Future. This is the website that I use for a lot of my design and consultation. Although I don't do it professionally, I, I do like to help people find uh, something that they can add to their landscape to help them out, uh, with, with getting something growing, especially if it's a nice perennial. If you're using this particular website, you can always plug in the common name or the Latin name for a plant here and then hit search. And if it's in the database, it'll, it'll put it up there for you. All right. So the way to use this particular website is very easy. You can either search for the plant by common name or botanical name here. Or if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, but you know you were looking for a particular mm, kind of something. Let's say I'm looking for edible plants. Let's look for plants that are really edible. I'm going to list this at four and five on the scale of one to five between minor and great for edibility. Let's come down here and have a look at, uh, let's see, we want staple crops. This is Proteins, oils or fats, perhaps a basic starch for carbs, maybe a more balanced carbohydrate, maybe something that's both protein and oil. So these things, if you grow them, you can eat them and they provide you with calories and protein that you can live on. That's where we're going to start. All right. And we're going to go to habit. And habit, we're going to pick out, we want trees. Perennials. I don't know of any bulbs that aren't perennial. Well, there are some that are biennial. Uh, we have climbers and annual climbers. Going to go. Oh, perennial climber. There we go. Ferns might might qualify. Bamboo might qualify. Um, and then we have shrubs, which are pretty much always perennials. So there's a there's our selection. You can also select things that are annual, biennial, things that grow from corms. Of course, regular old annuals as well. There's even lichens in here. Didn't know that lichens were edible, but the, there probably are some. Along the way, you can choose whether you want deciduous or evergreens. You can pick out the height that you want them to be. I'm not going to select anything for height and width. But for zone, we have both the, the UK hardiness zone and the USDA hardiness zones. I'm going to pick right smack dab in the middle, zone seven. Yes. yes. Um, can you tell? Boone, uh, what website this is from, so you can share it. Uh, Patty yeah. is asking. Okay, the website is called Plant for a Future, Plants for a Future .org. and if you look up at the very top of chat, I pinned a link for it up there, so you should be able to find it up there at the top of chat. All right. So I'm, I'm I'm picking out Hardiness Zone Seven, which is smack dab in the middle. But don't worry. If you're not in zone seven, because many of the plants that are here go all the way from two up to 11, some of them even to 12, I would imagine. Most of them are going to fall in the range of six to nine, but there are some that are, that are two, two to seven, and we'll get to those in just a minute. You can select growth rate if you want, if you're looking for something that's going to grow really fast because you need the shade or because you want to uh, harvest it for biomass. Your, your soil conditions, depending upon what those are, you can pick for your soil conditions. 
not only the, uh, the light lightness or heaviness of your soil between sandy and clay, but also your base pH. And there's things that you can do to change the pH, and there's things that you can do to do, change your, your soil quality. Shade, depending upon whether you need things to grow in shade or not, you can select here. Of course, your moisture conditions here. Uh, maritime exposure, strong winds, not wind tolerant, things of this nature, how pollution tolerant these are, frost tenderness. And if you're really interested in finding plants that are in flower at every moment that your bees or other pollinators are out, you can select for when the plants are in leaf, when they're flowering, when the seed ripens, all of these things here are available for you to help, help refine your selection and plug in things to, to round out your overall design. I think the idea of having something that is in flower at all times is a great idea and it's worth looking into, but we're not going into that right now. Right now we're just looking for staples and there's a lot of them. So let's go ahead and hit our search button and I am not seeing what's happening here. Um, Adam's patch. I don't know if he's asking a question. Any tips on? I can't read that next word. Okay. Uh, it's like part of the part of its. It's like part of its missing. Let's see. Let me see if I can find it again. We had at seven twenty. Um, we had an error. We had an error. Uh, trying to get the, the search engine around here. So let's see here. It's the fourth word I can't read. Any tips on something removal under skin? But I don't know what that fourth word is. It's like part of it. Part of its. Briar. Briar. Any tips on briar removal under skin? Um. Uh, yeah, swab yourself down with some uh, with some disinfectant and get a scalpel <laughs> and some tweezers <laughs> and good luck. <laughs> oh, he's talking about you got something. Oh, okay, I get it now. Yeah, oh man, uh, that doesn't sound good. All right, for some reason we're 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 having an error here, so I'm gonna reset and go back. And try to get those parameters in here again. I don't know why that. I don't know why that failed. Hi, micro farmer. Hi, Homer. Okay, and I was looking for habit. Where is it? Bear with me just a moment here. Mm -hmm. All right. Conrad Homestead said, I hope you will be covering dirt prep, mounds, key lines, swalls, etc." Oh, not today, but probably eventually I will. <laughs> eventually I will. Uh, let me go ahead and try sharing the screen again. I, I managed to get it to, to come up, so. All right, so are we able to see the, the table here? Let me take a look. All right, yeah, I'm seeing the table. All right, so we're going to start out with, what do we have here? Hog peanut, American hog peanut. Oh, I'm going to skip that one. <laughs> That's... Uh, this is a kind of a leguminous plant. It's a perennial climber. We can go into it if you want to. I'm going to skip it and look at something more interesting, which is the ground nut. Perennial, edibility rating five, is Apios Americana. And here is a picture, what that looks like. This is the tuber that grows underground. And this is what the plant itself looks like. I think that's somebody's leg behind it. So that's a comparison. Small leaves compared to the leg and small flowers. So this is of the family Fabiaceae or the Lugumosin. It's a leguminous plant. There we go. 
USC hardiness from three to seven. So you're, if you're up north, all the way up to zone three, it'll still grow there, all the way to seven. It's usually found in low, damp bottomland, uh, riparian woods and thickets. It's also found around Indian campsites. That's interesting. Ordinary range is in North America, particularly in Pennsylvania. It's occasionally naturalized in Southern Europe. Edibility rating is a five out of five. This is actually a very good thing to eat. There is a little picture by comparison. There's the man, and that is how tall this plant would get next to you. So about four foot tall total. This would occupy your herbaceous layer, even though the, the edible part is the tuber, it would occupy that woody herbaceous layer. All right, it is a nitrogen fixer. So you can add this to your design if you're looking for things that are capable of fixing nitrogen. It's suitable for sandy medium and, well, sandy and medium soils, not heavy clay. Uh, it seems to like acid neutral and basic soils, so just about any kind, but it can grow very well in acid soils. It can grow in semi shade or light woodlands, that's what we're aiming for, or no shade. So if it's if you don't have your shade yet, it can still survive there. It likes it moist. All right. Here we have habitats, woodland gardens, sunny edge, cultivated beds. Edible parts are the root, the tuber, the seeds, and the seed pod. The tuber is eaten raw or cooked. It's noted to have a delicious flavor, somewhat like, like, somewhat like roasted sweet potatoes. It always receives very high, mar high marks and taste trial to us. There's more information on this. They don't have the nutritional information available as of yet in here. So some of these things, they don't quite have all of the nutritional information. If you're interested in growing it, here are cultivation details here. I'm not going to go over all of these, otherwise we'll be here all night. <laughs> but there's ample information to help you get started propagating this particular perennial plant. If you can find it, um, I contemplated going and finding it, but I don't think we have enough time to go find everything. Okay, there's a monkey puzzle tree. It didn't impress me too much, but you can go look at that. Um, breadfruit, fruit. did you know that breadfruit grows in our zone? I didn't realize that. Let's have a look at this. This is the breadfruit. Oh, nope, that's zone 10 to 12. Oh, I know what I did wrong. I did not. I did not click on zone, did I? I finally found my zone today. It's 8A. 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 All right. Let's go back. Okay. So there we ground that. What is bull Mitchell grass? Is anybody curious about this? It grows from zone four through 12. So it's got a wide range. They're rating it as a four for edibility. I've never heard of this plant. Let's go take a look. Bull Mitchell grass. That's, this is a grass. All right. So we're looking at maybe some sort of a ground cover. I think I've seen this before. This, does this look familiar? I've seen pictures of this. Before. I've seen this before somewhere. I just don't know. Uh, apparently it's native to Australia. So this is, what's it called? Bull Mitchell grass, Poetia family. I'm gonna have to figure out where this blog thing is that we're supposed to have for Shed Wars stuff. Mm. All right, this is native to Australia. So for you guys down under, this is an edible, in case you didn't know. Uh, so it can grow up to be about five foot tall comparative to this guy, so it's a grass that can get up to five foot tall. That would, we would call this a tall grass. Grows at a fast rate. Uh, just about every soil type. All right. Cannot grow in the shade. So can't have that out there in the shade, but produces a seed. Interesting. All right. Learn something new every day. Next we have... What are these? Biennial, perennial, wild cabbage, broccoli. Really, there's a there's a perennial brassica. This is brassica olacera, zone six through nine, edibility rating four. Wild cabbage. There's a, there's the, the plant and flower. Okay. Edibility rating four. I have a picture of it there. Once again, this is going to be one of those woody herbaceous plants. Not frost tenor, 
available or in flower from May to August. Seeds ripen from July to September. Of course, the leaves are the edible part. Raw or cooked, they're slightly better when raw. So there is a perennial cabbage. Okay, they've actually got they've actually got some nutritional information for these. 320 calories per 100 grams. That's that's a double cheeseburger right there. 23.5 grams of protein. Wow, that's a lot of protein too. Fairly high in, in calcium, phosphorus, not bad in iron and magnesium. Quite a bit of potassium too. What's what's the weirdest thing you've ever eaten, Jason? Like Weird. of all of these things that you grew, something kind of rare. Uh, well, I don't know about rare. Uh, I've I've eaten hairy bittercress. That was kind of interesting. <laughs> I've never tried. I've never tried a perennial cabbage before. But look at all that vitamin A that they've got there. All right. I think Chicken Johnny was talking about uh, an experiment with uh, with rice to add vitamin A to rice. And here's a perennial plant that people could be growing that has all of this vitamin A. And it was 15,000 milligrams of vitamin A in that 100 gram. Por How can you have 15,000 milligrams in 100 grams? I don't think that fits. They probably added an extra zero. <laughs> Don't ask me about problems. That, that, that's definitely one worth looking at for future reference, zone six through nine. All right, now here's one that I have some coming here in the next couple of weeks. This is Siberian pea tree or Siberian, Siberian pea shrub. It is a shrub, perennial, zones two through seven, edibility rating five, and here we go. Uh, you may have heard of pigeon peas if you're following uh, – those uh, those people down there in South Florida, food forest, Pete Canaris, Green Dreams, stuff like that, they're growing pigeon peas. Pigeon peas won't grow in zone seven, but we can grow this, which is very similar. Siberian pea tree or Siberian pea shred, shrub. Ah, Also the Fabiaceae or legum leguminous, <laughs> I can't pronounce this word, family, zones two through seven. It grows riverbanks, pebbles, sands, open forest, forest edges. We're going to have lots of forest edges, gully slopes and stony slopes. Range of Eastern Asia, Tiberia to Mongolia, occasionally naturalized in Europe and France. And yes, we do grow them here in our... Oh. Simply Jan has a question. Uh -huh. what, she said, what is that called? Siberian pea shrub or Siberian pea. If you have a look at this, at the way this tree looks, doesn't that look like a pea plant with little yellow blossoms? Only instead of being an a, an annual that you plant and have to tend to and baby, this one keeps on growing year after year after year. It keeps on producing year after year. All right. Uh, one thing I should note: there is a caution on these. Do not eat the green pods. Wait until they're fully dried and then cook the seeds. Don't eat green pods. This does have a bear resemblance to another perennial, uh, Scotch broom and Scotch broom pods are poisonous. Try not to get the two mixed up. All right. Uh, once again, as a member of the, the Fabiaceae family, this is a nitrogen fixing plant. So you can grow this in conjunction with your other trees. Not only will it produce an edible pea, which you may not necessarily eat yourself. You could also feed this to your chickens. Or, your, or your, your pigs or your other livestock, but it will also provide a source of nitrogen for your other trees and perennials. Okay, there's a comparison. Here's a picture of a one-story house, and there's where it comes up to in relationship to the house. Not very tall. 19-foot no. 19, 19 tall tops by about 13-foot wide at its maximum. Grows at a fast rate, which means you can cut it back and use all of that foliage that you cut back as mulch or as biomass to feed your compost. Most notable for attracting wildlife. And whenever I came down here and looked for cultivation details and some other notes, uh, it's been noted that people are using this as a fodder for chickens. So if you're raising chickens and you're wondering how in the world you're going to be able to get a source of fodder for your chickens or for your goats or you know, something that you could eat yourself in an emergency. I don't think they're 
that good. It says here they're a bland flavor and it's best to use in spicy dishes. But if you were looking for something that you could use as fodder for your animals that was perennial, that would always keep coming back. Yes, you can feed goats on them too. Um, this is a good choice to fill that niche. All right, how are we doing on questions and comments? How do we, um, Arkansas Woodcutter said, how do we get seed or starter plants? It's a good question. Uh, whenever you find something that you, that, you, that you like or that looks interesting to you, I, I would recommend that you don't just stop at going, well, that's nice. Go ahead and you know, do a Google search for that particular plant. Uh, find out more about it, find out everything you can about it, get some nutritional information, hazards that may be associated with the plant, other things that you might want to be aware of before committing yourself to getting that plant. And then of course, search for a nursery that might have it. In the case of uh, the Siberian pea, I found these at Burnt Ridge Nursery. Um, so David the Good is not the only person that shops at Burnt Ridge. <laughs> I get stuff from them too. It's a, it's a good place. They're up in Washington state. Um, once I've got these trees established and I, I start producing some of the seed from them, I will be starting plants and the, they will be available at uh, greencountryagroforestry.com from our website, which is in the process of being built right now. Okay, so this is kind of fun. These are my favorites, Caria hybrids, but particularly Caria illinoisensis. Caria illinoisensis zones five through nine and zone five incidentally all around Lake Michigan if you're on the lake is zone five so even in Wisconsin where uh, Mark Shepard is resorting to growing chestnuts because it's just too cold you can grow pecans in zone five and they'll grow all the way down into zone nine so um, mid to south Texas all right this is an amazing plant um Want to go on on about pecans just a little bit. Uh, they're the state tree of Texas. I wish they're the state tree of Oklahoma, but the state tree of Oklahoma is the red butt, which is another good plant, but um, more on that later. These will produce their nuts. The nuts will fall off the tree. They'll be gathered up by chipmunks and squirrels. They'll stash them away. Some of them won't get eaten and they'll wind up sprouting and forming nuts the following year. This is typically the way it would spread. Occasionally, the fall webworms will build their nests up here in the foliage. The webs will capture leaves, twigs, and of course, nuts. And when they fall, if this tree happens to be near a waterway or the land floods shortly afterwards, you'll find this going downhill towards the sea and spreading that way. But other than that, it doesn't really have a means of getting spread. And it's interesting to note what the natural range of this particular tree in the United States is. Um, it didn't wind up getting to the eastern side of the Appalachians until uh, Thomas Jefferson had some brought to him by the explorers, having discovered that these were a really wonderful nut. He planted some at the Monticello, and now they're all over the southeast. Um, but interestingly enough, there were some places on the western side of the Appalachian Mountains where these were not naturalized already. And the only reason I can think of is because there was a cultural difference. The people that lived there did not farm pecans. They devoted more of their effort to growing the uh, the white oak for their, their acorns. So this was a, a plant that was spread by indigenous peoples in North America for tens of thousands of years, or at least close to 10,000 years. Edibility rating, they're counting this as a four out of five. Uh, me, personally, this is a five out of five. <laughs> a, a, a pecan, if you've never had one, is an absolutely delicious nut. Uh, fairly easy to liberate from the shell. And once you've collected these nuts, they can keep for up to two or three years with some simple storage. Throw them into a bucket so the mice don't get to them and you're good to go. Uh, so deciduous tree growing up to 164 feet at a medium rate, they get big. So this is why these are the canopy. Uh, the spread is up to 60 feet. What more can we say about them? Um, the oil is good. It's a very healthy oil, better than a soybean oil for certain seeds. Of course, high in protein. You can make a milk out of the uh, out of the out of the the seeds of the pecan tree, like an almond milk. You can make a pecan milk. Um, 
root tea out of the leaves. I don't know how good that would be. I've never tried it. <laughs> but uh, just eating right out of the shell, 10 nuts makes up about a pound. No, sorry. 10, mux, 10, 10 nuts makes up a serving. It's 198 calories, and uh, there are 50 nuts to a pound. Mature tree in an off year is going to produce 450 to 500 pounds during a mast year, which is about every five years or so. You can get up to a thousand pounds off of a mature tree. So one tree by itself more than enough food to feed a person. And once it's mature, we're, we're talking lifetime. They live for hundreds of years. If you haven't started planting pecans and you live somewhere between zone five and nine, um, I stop making excuses. Get them in the ground. If not for you, for your children, for your grandchildren, for everybody else that comes along after you, these are a wonderful tree to be growing. I'm out of them this year, by the way. I've already given away all the ones that I, I grew. <laughs> this was my this was my non-dominant year. Like last the last year it produced, this year it did not. So yeah, yeah, they, they do they do have alternating years. They'll have they'll have some well, and it's not true for every tree. Some trees will not even produce in some years. And then some of them will have lower production in some years and then higher in others. It really, it really depends. Do you have a lot of other pecan trees nearby that can that can cross pollinate? There's one, but it's okay. really kind of in a bad place because it's like right next to the shed. So right. I was watering it, and my husband said, uh, "You can't water that because it might mess with stuff over there." So, I was, so it's, it's still there, but it's not being watered now because it's in a bad spot. So I don't need it to get big, I guess, and maybe mess up something on the shed. So. Yeah, you don't, you don't have, I don't want to have trees growing too close to the foundations of, uh, of your outbuildings and your house, of course. Um, ours are a good 15 to 20 feet away from the foundation. Their roots are going to go mostly down, but the ones that go laterally at that range are not going to interfere with our foundation. Um, important to note on pecans and also some of the other nuts that we're gonna get to here in a minute. Um, during the time that they're forming their fruit, they do need to be watered. They need to have ample supply of water to form fruit. Okay, so Caria hybrids are various other subcultivars of the pecan tree. Uh, Jason, uh, will pecan trees grow in zone 5B? Um, can you go back to where you talked about the zones? Someone's yeah. asking a question. Zone for, for Caria Illinois is five to nine. It will grow in five B. Five B. Okay. So yes. free handling made, yes. Yes, she can grow. She can grow them. Uh, after pecans, of course, we have our chestnuts. We have sweet chestnut, European chestnut, and various chestnut hybrids. Uh, if you would look at uh, New Forest Farm that's uh, being run by Mark Shepard up in Wisconsin, he's doing a lot of work with hybrids. So if you are at a place that maybe pecans don't grow so well in and you want something, uh, you can go up to zone four with some of these chestnut hybrids. Mark is developing some. There may be some that go even further north if you're in the northern hemisphere or south in the southern hemisphere. I would definitely check with, with him and other people that are doing research into chestnut hybrids for alternatives there. Now, chestnuts are primarily a uh, a starch, a carbohydrate source. So if you're on a keto diet, they're not great for you, but they're still a good source of calories. Uh, edibility rating four out of five. And you know, a lot of people are going to say that's a five out of five because a lot of people just really love this particular nut. They don't store as well as pecans do. They have a soft shell. Their outer shell is very soft. It looks a bit like this when it's mature. And that's a, a kind of a leathery co covering there. So it doesn't keep quite as well as a pecan, but it's still an excellent choice for a little bit cooler climate. These guys get up to 30, I'm sorry, 30 meters or 98 feet, not quite as tall as the pecans do. You couldn't really get by with growing a chestnut under a pecan though. It's still a big tree. But there is more information on chestnut if that's the area that you're in. And if you like the idea of growing a perennial that can take the place of corn as a carbohydrate source. Um, Mark Shepard feeds pigs on the chestnuts that fall from the trees. He just turns them loose 
and the hogs go out and they eat the chestnuts off, 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 off of the ground. So instead of being corn finished, they're chestnut finished uh, swine, which is really kind of cool if you're combining your uh, your uh, growing of, of animals along with growing of perennials. I'm gonna skip over some things here. There's uh, of course Good King Henry. You can go look at that sometime if you want. We're getting into some of my other favorites, which are the the Coralus, the hazelnuts, common hazel, hybrid hazel, and of course, giant filberts. These are uh, zone four through eight, and the hybrids, which is what I'm using here, are zone four through nine, all the way up to zone four, all the way down to zone nine, or flip the world upside down if you're in the Southern Hemisphere. Same thing goes there. These are the superstars. I believe this is probably the thing that's going to um, keep a whole bunch of people from starving in the future. Incidentally, uh, at the end of the last ice age, this was around um, 12,500 BC, over in Scotland, they've uncovered villages where the inhabitants were eating about 80% of their diet were hazelnuts, 80%. So looking at something that has the capacity to feed a population, this is definitely a nut that can do it. It has done it before. Very popular in Europe, incidentally, hazelnuts are. They're not quite as popular here in the United States. A lot of people just think of them as being a flavoring for your coffee or something that you put into candies. But here they are, edibility rating five out of five. Um, one pound of these in the shell has around 1,600 calories. And one- have a, You have a question. Yes. What ratio of nitrogen fixers do you recommend? Uh, I'm gonna go with uh, what, what was recommended to, uh, recommended to me by um, Stefan Sukoviak at uh, La Ferme Miracle in Quebec. In his permaculture orchard, he is doing a ratio of one nitrogen fixing tree to every two production trees. Also, I would add to that in your in your ground layers, try to add some nitrogen fixers in there as well. For example, the, uh, the ground nut would be an excellent choice. That'll give you nitrogen fixing plus an additional tuber of crop that you can dig up at your leisure because those tubers, once they're established, they just keep getting bigger and bigger and spreading. And so you decide, okay, it's time for me to dig some up and eat them. Um, and there are many other nitrogen fixers, which we'll cover in some future episodes of this particular uh, this particular stream, because we've got a long way to go before we cover everything. Um, and we're just looking at zone seven right now. <laughs> but of course, uh, as you'll notice, this is zone four through nine, which includes zone seven. All right. Um, uh, a word of caution on hazelnuts. European hazelnuts do not do well in the United States of America. So if you're getting hazelnuts, make sure they're not European cultivars. Mark, unfortunately, ordered a bunch that are European cultivars of hazelnuts, and the risk that he's running there is the eastern filbert blight. It could hit his crop and wipe it out, or it might not hit his crop. It really just depends. He could get lucky and have them grow for, for decades without ever having a problem, or he could wind up getting hit early on and have to start over. In Oregon, they're starting to make the switch to hybrids because the filbert blight has managed to cross the Rocky Mountains and they're starting to lose crops to them over there in Oregon. So the cultivars that I'm using are at the moment, I'll, I will probably add some more in the future. I'm using the Jefferson cultivar, the Etta cultivar, the Yamhill cultivar, and I'm adding Doris here this spring. I have Doris hazelnut trees coming as well. All four of these are hybridized between American hazelnut, which are resistant to filbert blight, for blight and the Europeans. So they're going to be resistant to the disease and also produce large nuts and are viable all the way down to zone, zone nine. So even people in Texas can be growing hazelnuts. Now here's the cool thing about these guys. I'm gonna here's, have to find some now. Here, here, here's, here's a comparison. They can get up to, whoa, 82 feet if they're allowed to, of course, but that's going to be some particular types of hybrids. The Americans don't get anywhere near that big. They can be very easily controlled to a 10 to 12 foot size. So I keep them small, keep them cut back every nine years, cut them back all the way. Um, they can do well in semi-shade or light woodlands or no shade. So light woodlands underneath a pecan tree, for example, hazelnuts. Now the hazelnuts, from my experience, are going to start producing nuts by year three. Year three, you've got nuts. Year nine, you're at maximum production. So a good one to look at. I think this one's gonna be really great for us in the future. 
A uh, mature tree will produce up to 25 pounds. That's uh, about 20 days worth of food per person. If you're keeping that at a footprint of 10 foot by 10 foot, that's not a lot of space. All right, what else do we have here? I'm unfamiliar with this guy, Prairie Mimosa. We could go look at it, but we're running out of time. Let's take a look at the Scoria batatis. This is a Chinese yam. I believe they refer to this as cinnamon vine. Grows from zone four through 11. This is a vining plant. So it's gonna occupy that vine layer. The tuber grows in the ground, of course. Edibility rating is five out of five. Incidentally, the, uh, the all the members of the Discoria genus are able, you're able to eat these raw. You don't have to cook them, unlike uh, regular potatoes that you would have to cook. Discoria can be eaten raw, and this is going to be a, a storage starch type of crop. So lots of calories. Physical characteristics. Well, here's a picture of the man. There's the picture of the plant. Yeah, they get a little bit bigger than you. But they'll climb up into those trees just fine. And, of course, the tuber will grow underground. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how far away from the pecan would you plant a hazelnut bush? Um, to give the to give the hazelnut enough room for, it, for its maximum spread, at least 10 foot. Maybe 15. And then you'll have... Enough room for more than one hazelnut under one pecan, obviously. I've got another diagram. I'll bring that up at some point in the future where I've, I've taken an entire acre and sort of shown a template of what it might look like if you were to plant it this way with pecans, with hazelnuts underneath those, with uh, some of these other nitrogen fixtures interspersed, uh, Siberian pea. Uh, I think I added in some, uh, some alder trees as well. There's a special role that alder trees play not just because they provide a wood source for edible mushrooms, but also uh, there are associations that they make with mycorrhizae beneath the soil surface, sort of binding together your, your woody nut trees and your fruit trees as well, so they can all share in that same network of, uh, of mycorrhizae. But more on that in a future episode. All right, um, where are we at here? This is, uh, okay, this is a Chinese yam. Cinnamon vine is a, is a common name for it. Um, very edible, and I don't know if they've got our, our nutritional information up here. They don't, but this is a very, very high calorie crop. Um, one thing that you might want to know about it before you get started growing it is the the tuber can get to be about as big around as your, as your wrist and around three foot long. So, and, and it likes to go straight down. So, if you're growing them, you might want to consider growing them in containers. But a lot you can allow the the vine to go up into your into your upper canopy. Conrad Homestead said, "I'd like to see that diagram, Jason." All right, I, I, I'll, I'll I'll be bringing it out here in in, in the near, near future. I've got uh, an entire program of nothing but diagrams showing starting out with one acre, then we start adding in, in the big trees, then we come in with everything else, and it's I'm still working on part of it. So I do. That. <laughs> it is coming. What do we have here? Huh, wheatgrass. Okay. Uh, apparently there is a, uh, it's called pubescent wheatgrass and perennial buckwheat. I'm going to skip the wheatgrass and go straight to the perennial buckwheat. Zone five through 10. And the reason I'm going to, going to this one, this is edibility rating four. The reason I'm going straight to buckwheat is because you're going to see me planting some buckwheat here in the next few months. As Shed War starts, this is one of the plants that I'm starting and growing is perennial buckwheat. Here we go. USDA is on hardiness five through 10. This is a perennial, it's not an annual. It does produce a grain. This is what's used to make soba noodles, if you like Japanese food, yakisoba. Um, soba noodles made out of buckwheat. Edible already, uh, edibility rating four out of five. All right. There's a comparison. There's the little flower next to the man. Oh, isn't it cute? It grows to be maybe up to three foot, three inches tall, and it grows fairly fast. Suitable for any kind of soil, light, heavy, sandy, whatever. Likes it sandy, or likes it well-drained, and it can grow in heavy clay and nutritionally poor soils, which makes it 
a great choice if you have bad soil. It doesn't mind what the pH is. It, it can grow in acid soils, neutral soils, or alkaline soils, and it likes semi-shade or no shade, either one. Conrad Homestead wants to know, where'd you get the buckwheat? Uh, I ordered buckwheat from Baker Creek out of Missouri. Whenever their website opened up again, I was able to order order seeds from them. I ordered, uh, I ordered four packs of uh, buckwheat, of perennial buckwheat. This stuff has pink flowers. It's very pretty. All right, so edible parts. The leaves, raw or cooked, you can use them as salad or as a spinach substitute. Uh, they're said to be of excellent quality, um, but uh, some people say they have a, a, a certain bitterness whenever they're eaten raw. The leaves are rich in rutin, uh, so they can make a healthy addition to the diet. If you're interested in the medicinal uses of that, you can research more. Uh, they're good for blood circulation. All right, so uh, what else? Seed can be sprouted and eaten raw or cooked and used as a cereal. Of course, dried and ground into a powder can serve as a thickening agent in soups. And of course, the uh, the soba noodle are notorious for having been made out of buckwheat. Well, they're still being made out of buckwheat. Soba noodles are good, by the way. <laughs> Seed is rich in vitamin B6. Uh, and, and this is how you can tell most of the people posting here are British. It is not freely produced in Britain, unfortunately. <laughs> but it should it should do well for us here in the states. Probably would do well in Australia, and if it was a bit more widely widely grown in Britain, it would be better. All right. Tinker's wife said buckwheat pancakes. So you use it like a grain, like a flour, right? Like you yeah. were making bread, some kind of bread, or right. But it's not. But it's non glutinous, so you you won't be able to. You won't be able to make bread with it, but you can you can use it as a, as an ingredient for uh, your breads. Uh, if you were growing growing a a glutinous crop as a perennial, like a perennial rice, for example, or or a perennial wheatgrass, you could use those grains for the gluten and use the buckwheat for uh, a boost to the protein content. And of course, you can make noodles out of the buckwheat with just you know, forming a flour, adding adding egg and salt. Um, what else do you need to know about it? This is also a very good uh, tillage crop, cover crop for uh, regular agriculture. If you were doing more conventional agriculture, it makes a good cover crop. Look at that, look at that tapper, it just goes straight down. All right, backing up a little bit. What else do we have here? Uh, maidenhair tree, ginkgo, I'm not going to get into that one. Uh, it's another long-term thing to grow. Uh, very edible, but it's mainly the the, the leaves. They're uh, said they had some good medicinal properties, help with uh, memory and things of that nature. We have perennial soybeans. If you're interested in perennial soybeans, did you know that there was a perennial soybean? Of course, this is once again a nitrogen fixer. Growing from zone seven through eleven. If you guys are in the south and went. We're looking for something. Here you go, from seven to eleven. Um, and some species, the raw mature seed is toxic; it must be thoroughly cooked before being eaten. So, be aware of that. Obviously, don't eat raw soybeans. <laughs> I wouldn't anyway. I have seen these growing wild. Incidentally, um, not too far away from here is a, a woodland preserve area called Turkey Mountain. They've got bike paths all over the place, and. Uh, I like to go off the bike paths and go tramping through the woods and I found some interesting things. And I found some of these growing in a clearing there. And uh, I did eat some raw, it didn't kill me. <laughs> Edibility rating is four out of five. And they're, they're a soybean, they're, they're, it's, it, it's soybeans. Um, not the greatest thing in the world as far as I'm concerned. I don't like the oil that they produce. Uh, it, it turns into a polymer too easily at high temperatures. So I'd much rather cook with uh, something like a peanut oil or a sesame oil, which doesn't polymerize. But there's a comparison. There's a man standing next to a tiny little perennial soybean plant. Isn't it cute? It grows up to be about two foot tall. So this is this is uh, in that herby, uh, uh, herbaceous perennial layer or possibly even ground cover. I imagine you would, if, if these things were growing without any sort of support, they would lie prone and be a ground cover. The one that I found in the clearing would, would certainly classify as a ground cover. 
course, it can fix nitrogen, so it's suitable for, for that sort of operation. Grows in light and medium soils, so sandy and loamy soils. It does like well-drained soil, can tolerate any sort of soil pH, and of course can grow in semi-shade, light woodland, and it prefers the soil most moist. Most of the things that we're covering here grow well in light woodlands for some odd reason. I don't know why that is. Maybe maybe that's part of the overall design. So there is perennial soybeans. All right. Uh, perennial sunflower. There are perennial sunflowers. Of course, if we're talking about perennial sunflowers, we're going to be talking about Helianthus tuberosus before too awful long. And I believe uh, Robert at Homestead Aquarius knows quite a, quite a bit about these guys. Uh, I believe Mark at uh, Arkansas Woodcutter knows quite a bit about the, these guys. These are Jerusalem artichokes, perennial, ones four through eight. You eat the tuber, edibility rating four. They grow a tuber. This is what they look like. We used to call these black-eyed Susans, grow all over the place. Have you seen this plant before, growing wild? I'm sure you have. Spend any time driving through the country, you're going to see this off the side of the road, in a ditch, in a field, everywhere. Of course, that's what the tuber looks like. This is the edible part. I believe you're supposed to peel this and uh, and boil it or roast it. I'm not quite sure. You'd have to have one of the guys that actually grows them. I don't grow this one, but it is a possibility that you could consider. A little bit taller than a man, so it's going to be in between the, the shrubs and the ground. Probably probably the, uh, the herbaceous perennial layer. It cannot grow in the shade, however. So in the uh, in the diagram that we were looking at, it would have to be out here on the on the edges. And there's a plug for Baker Creek heirloom seeds. All right, what else do we have here? Sea buckthorn and sea berry. For more information on sea buckthorn and sea berry, I'm going to refer you to my friend Sean at Edible Acres up there in the Finger Lakes region um, of New York. He grows this particular plant. He grows a lot of this plant and he sells this plant. He's got a nice little tree out there. Zones three through seven. Also, edibility rating five. It is, it is of course, a berry or a fruit. Heart seed walnut. Also, uh, Sean grows these guys as well. This is a kind of an interesting one. I'll just bring it up so you don't have a picture of it. No, we don't have a picture. Okay. So, I'll tell you about this one. We're getting, a, we're getting some echo or something from, from your side, Gail. Oh, me? Yeah. I, I don't know what it was. All right. Um, Someone walked by and said something. Maybe it was that. Ah, okay. All right. So you've seen these tassels on trees before. This is pretty common for members of this particular genus. Also, pecans will have tassels that look like this. This sort of hang. Around. But the, uh, the the nut for this uh, this particular heart seed walnut um, does look like a heart. It's got that that classic heart shape. Uh, well, kind of like that, <laughs> right there. Edibility rating four out of five. Uh, this is also known as a Japanese walnut, and Zones four through eight is where you can find them. Uh, as a member of the, the, the Juglans genus, it does produce a, a hormone from its roots that is hazardous to other plants around it. There are plants that can grow that are adapted to growing in conjunction with walnuts. Um, don't happen to have a list of them handy at the moment, but if you like walnuts, don't be discouraged. You can build a, a forest that has a walnut as your primary canopy tree, and you'll be just fine. Um, there's some things you won't be able to grow, like apples, but there's plenty of other things that you can grow along with it. Of course, now we've got our regular walnut, the English walnut, Persian walnut, Carpathian walnut, these guys. And as long as we're here at walnuts, there's one that did not show up in this search. Um, the black walnut, the, the North American black walnut, was rated as a three on the edibility scale. This is just crazy because as far as I'm concerned, that is a five all the way. Hard to get out of the shell, but they are absolutely delicious whenever you do. Uh, Carpathian walnut, English walnut, Persian walnut, whatever you want to call them, zone seven through nine. So all the way down into, into mid, mid Texas, lower Texas. Well, not always South Texas, but you know what I mean. Uh, you can grow these guys 
That's for classic English walnut. They're rating them as a four out of five for edibility. Once again, I think that's an understatement. These are very, very tasty. Lots of protein, lots of good oils for you. Um, 65 foot is the is the the height. So this is a fairly short tree by comparison. Um, I think the old Carpathians got a lot bigger, but they grow at a medium rate. They say, eh, I would call it a slow rate. We're probably looking at a good 15 to 20 years before you get any decent production from them. Ooh, but they are, wild. but they are absolutely delicious and wonderful. And um, I wouldn't pass them up. <laughs> I wouldn't pass them up at all. Of course, I like some of the things that they compete with. So I wouldn't have this planted everywhere, but I do like some walnuts here and there. Robert paid you a compliment. He said, you are doing a great job here, brother. People can learn a lot here. Right now, a great use of, li of a live stream. Ah, oh, thank you. Uh, I'll bet Robert's got some walnuts. I'll bet his are black walnuts, though. I'll bet. All right. So once again, like a like a like a pecan tree, these guys are something that takes a long time to grow. So you know, as soon as your kid's born, plant one. <laughs> plant one of these every year until they hit seven, and then start in on some of the other other stuff. This is I have no idea what this is. I'm not going to click on it. I have no idea what it is. <laughs> Whatever it is, it grows, it grows from zone three through ten, and it's uh, rated as a five. This might be a superstar. Whenever you're going exploring on your own might look into that maybe it's something you want of course here we have linum perennial this is uh linum luisi i actually have some of these seeds um not within arm's reach of me at the moment but i do have some um this is a perennial flax so of course you can eat the flax seed high in protein high in vitamin e and you can use it as a fiber plant if you're interested in making cloth or string uh, seeds from, from some some strains contain cyanogenic glycosides, and although the toxicity is low, especially if the seed is eaten slowly, it becomes more toxic if water is drunk at the same time. Blah 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 blah. They have to put this out here because there is a there is a a chemically similar to uh, to cyanide component found in these. Incidentally, there is a chemically similar to cyanide component in apricot seeds, which it's called Laotril, and it's been proven to eradicate cancer, in case you were wondering. Not that I'm a doctor and not that you can take my medical advice on anything. I'm just saying that's the anecdotal information. <laughs> uh, edibility, four out of five. Good plant to grow for, uh, for a number of different reasons. What else do we have? Uh, alfalfa and let me skip alfalfa. You can always go back and, and look at alfalfa too for fodder for uh, for your animals. Apparently, you can eat it as well. I don't know if I'd want to eat it, but we have these guys: the lotus, American water lotus, lily pads. Of course, if you have a pond, aquatic ecosystem, you can grow these. Zone four That's through eight. If you are building your own little forest garden, I would highly recommend that you put in an aquatic space, if nothing, if for no other reason, to encourage some frogs to be in your landscape. Not only are they going to have pretty music to uh, to to serenade serenade you with at night, but they do a great job of controlling insect pests in your garden as well. Mm. All right, so you're going to find these in floodplains. Of course, if you make your own little pond habitat, you can have these pretty little flowers on the lily pads available to you there's the edibility rating and they can actually get fairly big although a lot of this is underwater edible parts root cook it's usually steeped in water prior to cooking to remove bitterness it is rich in starch so we're talking carbohydrates here uh, when baked it becomes sweet and somewhat mealy somewhat like a sweet potato huh that's interesting you can harvest the root in the autumn and store it for several months keep it indoors so you don't have to go out there in the middle of the winter and break the ice off the surface of the pond to go dig up some 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 roots in order to have something to eat. The leaves and young stems when cooked, the seed raw or cooked is good, has a very agreeable taste. The seed can be dried, ground into a powder, and used for making bread. There we go. 
but it's glutinous. You can make bread with it. Uh, the bitter tasting embryo, that would be the germ of the seed, is often removed because it has a bitter, a bitter taste. The seed itself contains up to 19% protein, and an edible oil can be extracted from the seed if you have an oil press. I happen to have an oil press, so that's pretty cool. There we go. So it's not just not just stuff growing under the trees. Well, you can have a pond under the tree if you want. Uh, let's look at sacred water lotus. What is this? Also zone four through eight. I know one of these uh, has a narcotic effect. I don't think this is this one. What a pretty looking flower that has on it. Look at that. How would you like to have that growing in your little frog pond in your woodland garden? Maybe with Good a little... Night. Maybe with a little waterfall circulating the water trickling. And of course, once again, edible root cooked as a vegetable, starch. Uh, very relished in Chinese cooking. Has a mild flavor and a crisp texture. Of course, once again, leaves, root, seeds, stems, all the parts of this of, the, of this plant are edible. And it's, wow, pretty to look at. If you had this in your garden, the homeowners association would just assume this is a pretty flower. Okay. What else do we have? Oh, perennial rice. Genus Oriza. That's that is rice. That's the same same rice, the same same genus that other rices are from. But this one is a perennial uh, family Poesia. Hardiness zone seven through twelve, so we can grow it here in Oklahoma, and you can grow it further south as well. Interesting note about rice: rice does not have to be grown in a rice paddy. The rice paddy is is, is grown and flooded, uh, grown that way and flooded that way as a weed control. You can you can grow it in ground normally. Herbivore rating four. Let's go down here and have a look. Of course, the seed is the edible part. So just like just like the the annual rice this is a perennial rice keeps coming back year after year worth looking into i think i do want to try growing some rice this year but it'll probably be an annual variety of course you probably have heard of runner beans scarlet runner beans this is an annual perennial but I'm not going to go into them too much. They, they, they're, they're interesting. They make a nice, pretty red flower and a, kind of a purple spot uh, bean, just like any other bean. But uh, a, there are a lot of beans that you can plant and grow up into the trees. I think Jules Small Gardening experimented with growing beans and letting them run up into a dogwood tree. And they got to be got to be about 25 foot up into that tree. So not just these, but all, all different varieties of, of uh, climbing beans can be used in that respect. All right, now we've got our we've got our pinus from the uh, the pinion pine all the way down to uh, what else we have here the Italian stone pine, umbrella pine, stone pine. And all of these produce pine nuts. So pine cone with a seed on the inside. Uh, whenever the whenever the pine cones are are done and ripe, you take them out and put them uh, in, near a source of heat, which causes them to open up, and then you can remove the pine nuts. It's a bit of a labor-intensive process, but pine nuts are fairly tasty. They're used in gourmet cooking all the time, and you can tell these grow in a wide variety of growing zones. High in protein, pine nuts are. Yeah, I actually used them in uh, in chili when I was on my plant paradox diet. I used pine nuts instead of beans. Oh, cool. It was good. It did have the consistency of a bean after it was in the chili for a while. So. Yeah, and really high in protein. They're, they're, they're not a bad food. Not a bad food at all. Now, of course, we've got our apricots and cherries, Manchurian apricot, sweet almonds. Do I need to click on almond? You know what an almond is. Zone so six through nine. Ah, here in Oklahoma, I, I kind of am hesitant to to get an almond. There's a, the Texas Mission almond could possibly be grown here, but I would have to put it. Uh, I'd have to give it southern exposure, like I just did with those figs that I transplanted. That video is coming out Friday, by the way. Um, 
does not like the cold. So although technically it's it can be grown in zone six, if you are growing it in zone six, give it a microclimate, shelter it. Kudzu, yes, it's edible. I'm not going to recommend that you get kudzu. But if you happen to have it already, you can eat it. It's an edibility for it. Of course, we have a variety of oaks. Um, uh, you have a question. Yes. Are pine nuts and pinions the same? Pinion is a type of pine, and it does produce, uh, it does produce a pine cone. The pine cones do produce pine nuts. So, pinion is one of the one of the varieties of of, uh, of pine tree that produces pine nuts. Okay, so we have a variety of oaks. I don't know why the rest of them aren't showing up here. Probably because the edibility rating is listed as a three. Um, but this is Quercus ilex, holly oak or evergreen oak. Nice elongated acorn on this guy. Zones four through 10. You'll find these in Britain. Considered to be a five out of five. Wow, look at that. Growing up to 82 feet tall. This is, of course, one of those really big trees that takes a long time before it reaches its full production. So start it early if you're going to have it. You can get oil from the seeds, which are acorns, of course. The seeds are edible. You can roast them and use them as a coffee substitute. Uh, raw or cooked can be sweet or bitter, depending. Uh, dry granite powder uses a thickening of stews, etc. Or mixed with cereals for making bread. Uh, it does contain some bitter tannins, but those can be leached out by thoroughly washing and running water. Uh, but you also lose some of the minerals whenever you do that. Typically, the way you pre prepare any acorn, if you're preparing an acorn to eat, is to get your water going, get it boiling, throw the, nut throw the nuts in there after you've, you've removed the husks and the shells. Let them boil for a couple of minutes, allow them to sit and steep for a few minutes, maybe an hour or two. Pour off the water and then change it out once or twice to get <coughs> Tannin, so it won't be quite as bitter. You'll still have all the calories, but you will lose a lot of the minerals that way. But uh, for some of them, it's the only way you can make them palatable, which is once again probably why they're not highly listed. White oak acorns are pretty good, and uh, I think they're called chinapin, chinapin, something like that. I can't pronounce it. There's a variety of, of oak that we you can find here in Zone Seven, growing wild. That uh, the acorns are said to be slightly sweet even without having to do any special processing. So those are kind of cool. This is incidentally what the uh, the Cherokee would have been eating a lot of back, at, back east before the, the relocation. They did not eat pecans back east. They hadn't been uh, introduced. That was a different civilization that was spreading them. But uh, Cherokee eat a lot of pecans now. <laughs> a lot. See, we have uh, sorrel, garden sorrel. Sorrel, edibility rating five. Perennial cereal rye. Really? There's a perennial rye grass. Look at that. Zone three through nine. So way up north and eh, down south even a little bit. I think I've seen this growing wild before. All right. So this gets to be up to six foot tall. Rye grass is also used as a cover crop in some areas, but this is a perennial can grow in any type of soil and under any sort of pH conditions. Uh, it cannot grow in the shade. A lot of these grasses, a lot of these grass crops cannot grow in the shade, but it is something that you can grow while you're waiting for your larger trees, for example, the uh, pecans and the walnuts or your hickories or chestnuts or uh, oaks or pines to get big. You can grow this while you're waiting for that to happen. Edible parts are the seed. You can get an oil from the seed as well. It is a staple crop. Uh, let's see, perennial hybrids are now under development. Wild perennial species, top, commonly found in Turkey, have been used as a staple crop. So people are eating this already. It's not. It's not that unusual to find somebody eating this one. All right. There's also a perennial sorghum. Sorghums are kind of worth looking into. Um, most sorghums are perennial. The one that they're showing here is a bad example. We have a lot of this growing around here, and I wish we didn't. This is this this particular cultivar originated in Turkey, and it was brought over uh, during the 1800s 
to help control erosion in Alabama, and then it spread, and it spread yeah. everywhere. Of course, you recognize what this is. This is Johnson grass. Um, not every perennial sorghum is Johnson grass, but make sure you're picking out one that's good for eating. <laughs> this one you can eat, but it's not not fantastic. Zone seven through twelve. Uh, some people are allergic to uh, the pollen from this. All right. If you get a good one, the stem and the seed are both edible. Uh, depending upon which one you get, the seeds can be can be eaten. This is known as millet. Millet is a type of sorghum. It is also perennial, and the stems can be cut back for sugar production. Um, I always wondered why the subsidy, the farm subsidy, was for the growing of corn for making ethanol. Whenever sorghum would be a much better feedstock, it just didn't, never did. It never did make any sense to me because you can cut this back two or three times a year. And get tons of fermentable sugars out of it. Doesn't sorghum look like little baby popcorn? Um, Can it be popped like a little popcorn? You some varieties you might be able to. I haven't tried with uh, the one that they're showing in the picture here. This is Johnson grass that they're showing here. Yeah. I haven't tried popping Johnson grass. I have. Uh, I have dried, threshed, and, and and ground up the Johnson grass seeds, and yeah. used them to, to to make biscuits with. They were kind of flat and hard and not all that tasty, but uh, they do fill up the empty <laughs> place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think you would be much much uh, happier with a with a regular millet, uh, which is a staple in all in Africa, all over Africa. Incidentally, is millet is very very widely used there. Uh, I don't know what this one is. This is Japanese torea. Has anybody heard of this one? They're calling it an edibility rating five. I'm going to look at it. I'm just curious. Okay, this looks like some sort of a fruit or a nut, maybe. Zone six through eight. What an interesting looking uh, leaf pattern. Mm -hmm. Certainly wouldn't be able to mistake that. This guy gets up to 65 foot. And. The seed is raw or cooked and used in confectionery, so it's sweet. It's got a sweet fruit, aromatic flavor. Said to be laxative if eaten in excess. <laughs> okay. And edible oil. Okay. Well, I don't know if I want that one or not, but uh, I'd, like to try, I'd like to try some of that fruit one of these days and find out what it tastes like. Yeah. All right, and then we're getting down here to uh, narrow leaf cattails. That's another thing that you can be growing in your in your aquatic system, along with your your lily pads. Uh, almost every part of the cattail is edible. Gets to be a little bit taller than a person. Right. So roots, raw or cooked, can be boiled, eaten like potatoes, or you can mash them up and boil them to yield a sweet syrup. The roots can also be dried, ground into powder, and used as a thickener for soups. Added to cereal flours, it's rich in protein. Uh, and use the powder to make biscuits. Young shoots and spray yeah. while are cooked are good, kind of like uh, uh, fern fiddle heads. Was there a question? Okay. Uh, you can use it just like asparagus, although why use it as a substitute for asparagus when you can just uh, grow asparagus? The basis of the mature stem is good raw or cooked, uh, although it's best to peel it first. Um, young flowering stem, raw or cooked, made into a soup, tastes like sweet corn. The seeds cooked are small and hard to harvest, but do have a pleasant nutty taste when roasted. You can get an edible oil from the seed, but due to the small size, it's probably not a very worthwhile crop. Pollen. Raw or cooked is as a, used as an additive to flour, or making bread, porridge, and etc. I've had the pollen; it's, it's pretty good. It can be eaten with the young flowers and makes it considerably easy to utilize. Pollen can be harvested by placing the flowering stem over a wide but shallow container, or your hat, <laughs> and then tapping the stem gently and bruising the pollen off with a fine brush, or just knocking them off with your fingers. Uh, and this will, of course, help pollinate the plant, and thereby ensure that both the pollen and seeds are harvested. Yeah, my cattails are pretty good. That's all you have to eat. But if you're growing them deliberately as part of an of an of an existing system that does other things for you, for example, you're growing fish in that pond, you're growing frogs in that pond, having cattails is just a no-brainer. 
And last, last but not least, we've got Urtica dioecia, the stinging nettle. I've heard it called one of the most nutritious plants I've seen yet. Of course, they're covered with little stinging hairs that uh, that hurt, <laughs> but apparently help relieve arthritis whenever you get stung by stinging nettle. But you can make a, a good nutritious uh, pot herb out of this. Let's see, leaves, oil, curdling agent for milk. Interesting. You can brew a tea out of it that's, that's uh, rich in vitamins and minerals. All right. So that is just a search for staple crops for zone seven. We haven't even gotten into all the other wonderful things that you can be putting into a perennial woodland garden for zone seven. You might have found a few things here that uh, that you can find a use for. I hope you find a use for Yes. Yeah, perennials, you plant them once and then you tend them. Uh, Did so, you hear that question coming from the other room? <laughs> kind of sort it. Re repeat what he said, just just to make sure. He said him. he said perennials are the ones you plant, and you don't have to plant again. I was like, yes. Right, right. You you you, you plant the plant once, and then unless something happens that kills the plant, uh, you get to keep that plant. You get to keep on harvesting from that plant for the lifetime of the plant, and in some of these ca some cases for your lifetime as well. Isn't lantana supposed to be a a perennial? It might be. I don't know. I, I um, have managed to kill it, and it's supposed to keep growing. Right. So I was like, oh, you killed it. You killed my plant. He says, annuals, you plant annually. Yeah, exactly. Every year, you have to plant an annual. But perennials, once you plant them, they're planted. And then all you have to do is make sure they don't get choked out by everything else. Tend them, prune them if they need pruning. Make sure that they, that they, they stay fertilized. Of course, there are perennials that you can grow specifically for fertilizing your other perennials and uh this this is the kind of garden system it's not set it and forget it you can't just okay we've got everything growing we're going to walk away from it and then never have to worry about it again if you don't keep if you don't perform your maintenance and upkeep it will get overgrown and it won't produce as well but, um you could get away with going away for a few days and everything won't die on you which is good uh try that with livestock try that with annual crops uh, a lot of people are afraid to leave because they've got annuals that if they don't get out there to water them, they're going to die. The perennials, they're a lot more forgiving. Um, as far as as far as set it and forget it, that's not entirely true. Uh, down in the Amazon, there are, are pockets, little islands of forest that uh, whenever people finally got around to researching what was there, they discovered that the bulk of those the plants that are growing there could compose one um, percent of all of the, the the plants that are growing in the Amazon, and the only thing they could figure is the people that were living there must have gone and deliberately seeded those plants and grown them deliberately, much like the uh, much like the, the pecan got distributed all across a particular region by indigenous people here in North America. A bulk of the edible species in the Amazon rainforest were deliberately planted and grown and they're still growing and they're still dense and thick and you can walk in there and, and find food that's readily readily available even though nobody has tended that particular food forest for well thousands of years now so um uh, if you're looking for a food system that you can you can establish that uh is going to be functional with a minimal amount of effort on your part i think this qualifies of course this is just the the staple crops, the the, the the calories and proteins. And uh, in the future, in, in subsequent episodes, we'll go into some of the other things that you can get that are good for you other than just the staples. But uh, any closing questions? Patty said we did a great job with the live stream and we need more like these. That's what she said. I'll, 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 I'm going to do a whole lot more like this. Uh, we'll, we'll go... We'll go ahead and go north next and look at some of the uh, the more boreal zones, so things that you can grow in uh, the northern states in Canada. And then after that, we'll go south and look at uh, uh, the more southern states and things that you can grow there. I'm really looking forward to seeing what we can grow in bio country. I think there's going to be a lot of cool stuff <laughs> that people can, can grow in a perennial way there. Jason, you're in, you're in Oklahoma, right? Yes. So... 
are you going to the Oklahoma meetup? That's yes. in May? You well, are I'm, going up? I'm yeah. planning on being there too. I, I intend on going to the meetup. Um, if, uh, if the mother-in-law is back out of the, uh, the managed care facility by then, uh, we'll arrange to have somebody be here with her. But, uh, at the moment, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, she's got a she's got a, a brace on her back, but her back isn't healing up the way it should be. So she's probably going to have to have surgery, and that's going to be a few more months, I think, before she's going to be ready to to come home again. So I may be free. <laughs> yeah. How far away are you from uh, where they're having it in Prior, Oklahoma? Oh, probably about an hour and a half, two hours. Oh, okay. Not far. I just thought about that. I heard it on Journey along with Shannon. She was doing a live. And then I remembered you were from Oklahoma. I was like, I wonder if he's going to be there because it's like right right there in his neighborhood. So I'm going. Well, I'm glad everybody enjoyed. Hello, Miss Bose Bros. I hope I hope you're here for at least some of the some of the show. I wasn't keeping track of everybody's. I wasn't keeping track of everybody's chat because, of course, I had the other screen up and I was scrolling through and, and looking at things. Uh, well, it looks like we're about an hour and a half. So, yay, not too bad. I won't keep you much longer. Uh, last call for comments, questions, anything? All right. Thank you very much for coming. And, Gail, thank you very much for, uh, for, for staying back there and keeping keeping track of the live chat and questions for me. That's greatly appreciated. Uh, guys, tip Gail. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for coming into the show. And I will be catching you next week at the same time, 7 p.m. Central, Wednesday. And we'll be uh, I think we'll be heading north into uh, Zone 5 and north of Zone 5 and see what's up there that we can we can sink our teeth into things so that is that like a new england area like uh massachusetts connecticut rhode island in there connecticut, rhode island the dakota um nebraska okay that's a little bit south but uh into canada we'll be looking for uh staple crops for that region so that you can start out by having food that you can live on growing in your yard instead of just having a couple of fruit trees and some some annuals that aren't really enough to feed you. Oh, is that your wife, Mary, right there? Is that your wife? Yeah, Mary is Tulsa Fox. That's okay. Nice. okay. I, I kept seeing her on there, but I didn't I wasn't sure. So hi Mary. Hi Mary. <laughs> Once again, thank you guys for stopping in and uh, I'm going to go ahead and close out the live stream now. Good night.